Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the members of the committee uh, for having me uh, today on, on this very, very important issue and uh, with such a distinguished panel. I, I'm, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not somebody who works in addiction care, nor do I have the amazing and, and actually very, very moving life story that uh, Mr. Thiessen just gave. Um, I come to you instead, as Mr. Schellenberger did the first witness today, uh, as an investigative reporter, somebody who has looked into this and written about this as a reporter. Um, I'm an attorney by trade, non-practicing attorney now, but for nearly the past 40 years, I've I had published 13 books of investigative nonfiction, and the last one was a 200-year history of the American pharmaceutical industry and drug industry worldwide, uh, called Pharma. Uh, the that book, about a third of it, is about the opioid crisis and how it developed, and how it came to be, and how it flourished. And when I started that project uh, five years ago, now six. Um, I originally thought I had a layperson's view of safe supply and harm reduction. I thought it was a good idea. I, I thought that in simplistic terms, what I now know are naive terms, in theory, I liked that there was sort of this solution that might be able to reduce the spread of disease and, and reduce deaths as well in a high-risk population it was very difficult to get access to. And that was uh, something that I thought was worth pursuing. What I found out over time is that safe supply is anything but safe, and that harm reduction, often as it's pushed nowadays in some cities, um, does not actually reduce harm um, in any quantifiable way. Uh, there's overwhelming support. You as politicians have a difficult task ahead of you because you're balancing this issue against widespread public opinion support for what's viewed as safe supply, even though many people, when they say they're in favor of it, would not know what it is if asked in detail. Uh, if you do a Google search, as I'm sure you have, for safe supply and harm reduction, the first couple of pages will only be articles or sources that sort of promote the idea of safe supply as being very, very good. And we've heard the benefits, and I'm not to say that there aren't benefits to it. If you're looking just at the addict, um, certainly there's a reduction in overdose deaths. Uh, it, you'll hear about the number of people who have been saved um, in safe injection sites uh, when uh, naloxone has been applied. Uh, you'll hear about emergency room medical costs coming down and government health care costs coming down. The problem is, in the studies that I came across, that I've analyzed, that I've looked at literally dozens of them, it's very hard to find what I call statistics or credible evidence that you can rely on and take home to the bank and say this is the definitive study. Because the problem is that many of the authors already come in with a bias towards safe supply. And as a result, they put their thumbs ever so lightly on the scale and they deliver the information in a way that makes it look especially to the broad public as though this is an easy solution to have. Um, of course, reduces the number of overdose deaths. Sounds interesting until you look at something like the, the supervised uh, consumption committee final report that came out uh, not long ago uh, in Alberta that showed that outside of the safe supply zones in, in Vancouver, the death rate was lower, of course, in the actual clinics, but 100% to 400% higher in the immediate adjacent area. The number of overdoses in San Francisco outside of the, the current experiment that's being run there has actually increased as opposed to decreased. So the same thing happens with redux, reductions in cost to uh, emergency care. Uh, that's because mo the emergency care being given to ODs in safe injection sites, of course, is naloxone that's being delivered at the SIS, not at the emergency care, not at the hospital. What about the generic claim that you often hear that long-term health care costs, what you have to deal with, because you're taking a dollar from one part of the system and putting it into another, you'll save money in the long run. Um, I've seen a report from Wharton that said that in San Francisco, for every dollar spent on safe supply, that uh, taxpayers would save about $2.30. That's very persuasive. But when you get into the numbers, what you find out, what they're actually looking at is they're looking at the number of people who end up then going into the hospital with an overdose, as opposed to those treated with an overdose at the site. And in addition, they're not considering what I call the long-term health effects of chronic drug use, from heart disease to kidney failure to pulmonary symptoms uh, to possible psychosis. So that's not taken into account. 
They're also not taking into account what I call the non-medical costs. So, for instance, in San Francisco, which has a needle supply program, in 2018, the last year for which I was able to get statistics, they distributed over 5 million needles. That sounds good. It's going to reduce hepatitis and HIV infections. But, of course, what does it also do? Um, two, of the, two million of the needles don't come back. So San Francisco had to spend another $13 million on sanitation services to be able to go around the city and pick them up. They also had to spend additional money, nearly $20 million, on what came out as additional police resources around the area for, for drug dealing in the open encampments. So there, there's no way to necessarily match apples and apples when you look at the long list on safe uh, when you consider this, I actually think in some ways um, I've come to believe that I call it for myself a PSAM, possibly safer addictive maintenance. If you think of safe supply as addictive maintenance, which it is, or addiction maintenance, is it safer? Possibly so, but that's the best you can say about it at this time if you're really looking at the at the figures and you're not somebody who's absolutely against it. I'm willing to be persuaded by the evidence that it's good, I'm also willing to be persuaded by the evidence that there are problems with it. And one of the things that I want to very briefly touch on, just for a couple of minutes before opening up for Q&A, is that from my work on the opioid crisis and how it played out in the United States and then in Canada and Europe subsequently, one of the things that happened is that opioids, prescription opioids, had been destigmatized. That's a key, I think, because we're talking about that with safe supply and very many of the harm reduction policies. Do we destigmatize the dangers of some of the most dangerous of the narcotics by supplying them? That clearly happened with prescription opioids. You talk to doctors who went to medical school in the 60s and 70s. They were convinced that opioids were used for end-of-life terminal cancer pain. When Cicely Tyson, the nurse turned practitioner, invented hospice in England in the 1960s, she was looking for an end of life pain medication that would be long term acting so she could send people home to die instead of giving it to them every four hours in an IV. And when that was finally invented in 1980 by a subsidiary in Britain owned by the Sackler family owned Purdue Pharma called NAP, it was a 12 hour acting morphine capsule. And when it finally, in the 80s, picked up a little bit of force, there was a reanalysis by pain doctors in an emerging field, most of them from cancer care, saying we think that we have over-stigmatized opioids. They are less addictive than we had thought before. And in addition, we should be treating pain as a standalone condition. So that's why you go into a doctor today, and among the five different diagnoses, they want to hear from you right off the bat. One of them is, what's your level of pain? On a scale of 1 to 10, how are you feeling today? And if somebody has pain, to treat it. And so in the 80s, you have a growing acceptance and a belief with a small group of doctors that maybe opioids are not just for end-of-life palliative care. And then, of course, in 1996, the Sacklers and Purdue Pharma get OxyContin approved. They don't use morphine because they think that has too much of a bad sort of reputation with the public. So instead, they're using oxycodone wrapped in their 12-hour invisible polymer coating. And what does it take? I've seen the documents on the court cases. The sales force went out, and they told the doctors that you could use it for osteoarthritis, you could use it for back pain, and a whole host of things for which it had never been used before. And the doctors, it's not a, like a light switch. American physicians did not immediately turn overnight and start to prescribe it in record numbers so Purdue was making big money. It wasn't until 2001 that we get the first reports in the press about problems with diversion. And this means that it took five years for Purdue, with repeated visits to physicians, pain physicians, to be able to turn those physicians to destigmatize prescription opioids, to think that they could prescribe them for things that had not been that serious. So the process of the opioid epidemic that we talk about, that Dr. Humphreys talked about earlier as being a problem of oversupply, is also a problem of the way that prescription opioids came to be viewed, not only by physicians who were prescribing them as less dangerous than they were, but certainly by the patients who were taking them. And one of the considerations that I think you have, and I don't envy the task that you have as, as public officials, is in determining whether and if 
you do a safe supply system or program, to what extent you make sure that it does not destigmatize the drugs like methamphetamine and uh, the drugs like fentanyl and others or uh, hydrocodone and those drugs that on the street have a bad reputation and should continue to in many ways because they are so deadly. So I want to thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to give my presentation, my view on safe supply and what I've learned from the opioid crisis, and I hope it's of some assistance to you. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, and um, I will pass it over to Emily Rosen uh, to get us started with question and answer. Thank you so much for your presentation. You quite touched on this closer to the end already, but um, you have done quite an extensive amount of research on the history of the pharmaceutical industry, which again, you did touch on. Uh, I think there's no denying that opioids really came to the forefront of society and medical practice uh, through significant amounts of money and lobbying from manufacturers uh, of the drugs uh, when they were first introduced. However, I am curious what your take is on the role of opioids in modern day society in the year 2022, uh, and who is pushing this movement to now essentially decriminalize and, uh, and have the government provide these opioids and entirely normalize them in society? Uh, is it the medical community? Is it uh, the manufacturers? Who is behind this movement in modern day? Uh, yeah, very interesting. It's a good question. And it, it's not the, the medical community. It's not uh, the manufacturers. As a matter of fact, on the opioid crisis itself, the manufacturers are clearly to blame because they overmarketed, no question about it. But there's plenty of blame to go around. So you not only had the manufacturers over, you had doctors who in some cases were over prescribing. You had some who were running illegal pill mills and later lost their licenses as a result of that. You had pharmacies, some of the biggest chain pharmacies in the United States, uh, CVS, Walgreens, uh, Dwayne Reed, ended up paying multi hundred million dollar settlements with the Department of Justice for their acceptance of fraudulent prescriptions for opioids in some communities. Uh, you had distributors, billion dollar distributors, multi-billion dollar ones like McKesson, Cardinal Health, Amerisource Bergen, who knew where every pill was going. They knew when five million pills were going to a town in West Virginia with only 3,000 people, they never reported to the FDA. And the last one, the FDA, which I just mentioned, also behind the scenes, not responding aggressively, even though when they were pushed by the Drug Enforcement Administration. So the opioid crisis became in many ways the perfect storm. Uh, but it's not the manufacturers or any of those other parties today who are encouraging the use of, uh, of safe supply and the distribution of opioids at, at, at widely at that level. It's more from a group of in many cases, a drug addiction specialist or from uh, what I call um, groups, uh, sort of social benefit groups that really think this is the best way to go. I mean, I must tell you that I don't think it's all about money and profit. I've dealt with many parents who lost a child. Some of them, like Marianne Skolik, who I write about in, in my book, are still adamantly against safe supply. But many of the others who lost their children to opioids are adamantly and uh, uh, sort of, you know, passionately for safe supply because they think their child would be alive. So it becomes an emotional issue. You have uh, parents groups, you have opioid survivor groups that are pushing it. And the difficulty, I think, for you as politicians is there is this sort of widespread public support that says it must be a good thing. Only when you get into the details do you find the devils in the details and how many problems there are in almost every city that's rolled out a safe supply or safe injection site uh, program. Thank you. So I think there's no denying from your presentation, from others we've heard, that there are many unintended consequences uh, in jurisdictions that roll out safe supply. But one of the main arguments we hear for safe supply is that many addicts are not quite ready to take that step to recovery and treatment yet. And safe supply, it gives them... Um, gives a way of maintaining and staying alive until the point that they are ready. Um, until they are ready to take that step into treatment. So I would be curious if you know of any data from any jurisdictions, sorry, I'm choking, um, any jurisdictions that have implemented safe supply to suggest that where there is safe supply, there is an increase of individuals who eventually access treatment, or is there a decrease in those who access treatment where there's safe supply, or does the rate of those accessing treatment stay relatively the same regardless of a safe supply system? It, 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 
it's it's very interesting. I cannot find a situation yet that may exist in which somebody has done the analysis to show an increase or decrease the number of people seeking treatment in a given municipality, and then show how many of those people seeking treatment had been part of the safe supply program versus those who are coming in outside, either through a 12-step program, through a church, through a, a family uh, initiative to get them into supply. So they're not breaking it out like that. What I do find is I understand and hear the argument often that people aren't ready for recovery. There's also the discouraging fact that a lot of people enter recovery programs don't succeed. It's why we have such a, a high rate of people who relapse. So individuals look at that and say, well, recovery's not working now, so why don't we try safe supply because at least they can bide their time on a safe supply of narcotics until they're ready to go to treatment. And what I find in most of the situations I have analyzed so far is the safe supply takes away the impetus to go to recovery because what it does is it keeps the addiction going. It lets the addiction flourish. What you're doing is you're doing no harm in the sense that you are essentially building up a maintenance program to make sure that the addict doesn't have to go for recovery. And I'm not sure what the incentive is unless you build it into safe supply and encourage them to do so because otherwise you're going to end up with safe supply literally just being a maintenance program for addicts with very few ending up in, in real uh, uh, rehab. And then I'll pass it off to one of my colleagues. Um, I think from what you've said is that there is no data to, to break down uh, the reasons that individuals access treatment, whether that's through church or through their communities or through safe supply. But you would, you would say there's also no data to suggest that in jurisdictions where safe supply exists, there is more individuals accessing treatment than in jurisdictions that do not have safe supply. If but anything, you'd say it's the opposite and there is less. That's right. I mean, you can't determine that from the existing way the statistics are broken out, and that's part of the problem. Excellent. Emily Milliken. Uh, thank you, Mr. Posner, for being here. Um, and also, I just want to say thank you to my colleague, uh, Emily Rosen, for that. That was a really good line of questioning. So um, I'm going to take it then, uh, because of that, I'm going to take it in a bit of a, a different uh, direction. Noting that I think, um, I know that you gave us a little bit of a bio of yourself uh, at the outset. Um, I think that it's pretty fair to say that we have uh, a bona fide historian uh, in our midst right now, uh, having been a uh, finalist for the Pulitzer in history and then also having uh, extensive knowledge of the American pharmaceutical industry, um, specifically in prescription opioid business models. I was wondering if I could put you on the spot for the benefit of all those watching and for the committee. Um, to perhaps provide a little bit of an overview on the science of harm reduction um, and how perhaps it's changed since its, since its introduction however many decades ago when it was introduced. Yeah, you raise um, a good point because harm reduction is, you know, the two words we throw around all the time. Um, and uh, the, the very two things. First of all, the names are very, very positive. Harm reduction, how can you be against harm reduction? Right? And the, as a concept, of course you want to reduce harm. And safe supply sounds great because the word safe is there. So you think that we're combining both. When harm reduction starts and you look at it literally in the 1970s, 1980s, when there are harm reduction movements in New York, the, uh, the, they're talking about harm reduction. It's really built around having somebody stop their use of drugs by slowly giving them a support system that can get them off of uh, their addiction. Uh, and then we see the first place that it really takes place isn't until Switzerland, the 1980s. They start to lead the way in changing harm reduction to mean safe supply or some version of it, or a safe injection site even. They don't do it until the early uh, 1990s, but it's revolutionary at the time. But once that happens in Switzerland, then later happens in Amsterdam, then you have it happen in Luxembourg, and you start to see it happen in the European countries. It's being discussed inside of the uh, sort of clinical papers. Harm reduction moves from being a system where you could slowly wean somebody off of a physical addiction to a narcotic with a support system in terms of housing and, and financial support for in-between jobs. Maybe the government would be there and so would individual sort of networks that are helping them to becoming one just strictly about can we keep the addicted population with less harm if we save their lives, reduce the amount of uh, transmitted HIV and hepatitis infections from dirty needles, 
and give them drugs ourselves. And that transition really happens in the late 90s to early 2000s when it, when it takes hold. And today, if you talk about harm reduction or if you talk about safe supply, most people are thinking in terms of an establishment where the government either gives the drug, drug of choice, to the individual who's registered for the use, or it, in some cases, they allow the addict to come in with their own drug, which creates then an additional problem because that drug is tested at the site to see how, what it is. If it has an extraordinarily high amount of fentanyl that could be lethal, or it has rat poison or something else mixed in it, that center is then faced with the uncomfortable decision of what to do. Do they confiscate the sample and let the addict have nothing, or do they replace it with a government substitute that happens to be purer and better? So, you know, there are all the problems of diversion and everything else, but essentially, Harm reduction, which started out as a more of a, a weaning off of addiction, has today become a full substitute, uh, what I call for addiction maintenance. Excellent. Emily, Stefan. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you had talked about how uh, safe supply. Uh, contributed to the removal of a stigma against uh, partaking of drugs. And I'm wondering, in your research, how important is it for there to be a stigma on a behavior before someone will seek recovery from a drug addiction? Yeah, well, you know, I may be a dinosaur when it comes to this because I actually happen to think that uh, there should be needs to be a stigma um, attached to many of the drugs before uh, many people with an addiction will seek treatment. Now, I'm sure that right away there will be somebody who could prove the opposite and they'll give some case examples where somebody didn't think that the drug that you were taking was terrible um, and they still ended up going through full recovery and uh, getting clean of the drug. But I think that if we, to the extent that we destigmatize these drugs, as had happened with prescription opioids for doctors um, who were prescribing them. You know, doctors weren't prescribing uh, prescription opioids in the United States or in Canada or in the UK for back pain or osteoarthritis because they were evil or because they thought that they were doing something that was terrible. They actually thought at that point that the uh, that that opioid was all right and that their patients would not come back with addiction problems and it would an effective treatment. So you take away the stigma, and I think you make it easier, especially for young people. By the way, you know, one of the things that's very interesting here, you don't have, you have addicts who have been at 20 and 25 years. They have not overdosed, they haven't died. They may have had overdoses, but they, they're still alive. Uh, they've been, let's say, heroin users. Those are the 120 people that Michael Schellenberger talked about earlier that are in Amsterdam. 120 people literally out of a population of 17 and a half million. Uh, you know, in Switzerland, they have very, very firm rules before you can get a replacement for heroin. They had originally only allowed 1,000 people to have that. Now they have 3,000 in a country of 8.5 million. So you're talking about palliative care there. And it's so interesting to me as an aside, if you look at this as a history, that prescription opioids started as palliative care for terminal end-of-life cancer care. And here we are now talking about rolling out safe supply that would in essence be for, for many long-term users the equivalent of uh, palliative care for them. Uh, and it's not a good place necessarily to end up at. And for 20-year-olds who have been using the drug for a year, two years, three years, to let them know that they don't necessarily have to find a way to recovery, but they might be able to stay on a government-supplied form of heroin for the future, I think is the wrong message to send out. Um, can I just ask a supplemental? Of course. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate, as, as you're talking, I, I thought about safe supply, and it also seems to result, and I've heard this from other uh, speakers as well, as increased supply. And I'm wondering if the proponents, if, you've, if you're aware of any studies uh, by proponents of, of safe supply or otherwise, that looks at, uh, because there's an increased supply, um, what the impacts of safe supply are from a diversion, for example, context in seeing new men and women uh, become introduced to uh, supply of um, whether it's clean or unclean, uh, drugs that are inherently unsafe. 
uh, both in terms of new addicted individuals uh, from the incremental growth in supply or even additional deaths. The little question, I believe, that you certainly have a growth in the number of new users. There, there is no question that safe supply adds to the amount of narcotics that are available in the community, which the Safe Supply Institute is. Um, there are people who are getting the safe supply amount of the narcotic. They're going out. And as you heard from those doctors and those involved in addiction work earlier, um, many of those who are addicted are looking for a stronger hit. They will find it on the street through an illegal drug dealer, and they'll sell what they already got as their government supply to somebody else, so it filters out in the community. Why is it if those proponents of safe supply should go to Amsterdam and ask the police there uh, why they are having problems with Albanian and Nigerian gangs running drugs in a community otherwise in which you can get many of the drugs at a government institution? Because those drug dealers know that they are offering more bang for the dollar. They're giving you a, a combination sometimes of, of fentanyl or uh, mixed with methamphetamine, uh, what used to be called in the old days heroin and, and cocaine, a speedball that killed the actor John Belushi. You can buy things on the street you can't get from a government source. The same thing in plot splits, which is the plaza in Zurich, which many people know as Needle Park. Hasn't been called that in years because the Swiss cleaned it up in the 90s. They went in and did a sweep and took out all the outside drug dealers. But yeah, there's still drug dealing that goes in and around plot splits and around Zurich and in Geneva. Uh, the Swiss will tell you the same thing. Just because you have a safe supply, you don't necessarily eliminate the illegal market. San Francisco has seen that uh, in multiple ways outside of their, uh, you know, operating safe supply institute right now. And you don't uh, eliminate the need, uh, you know, police for local crime because still people are looking for something different. What you are doing is adding the supply, the government supply of narcotics distributed at the Safe, safe Supply Institute um, or center out onto the street in many cases because of diversion. Thank you, Member uh, Emily Yao. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Posner, for taking the time to speak with us. Um, your resume is vastly different than a lot of the other folks that have uh, spoken to us, and I find it very interesting specifically your high-level approach to a lot of these uh, aspects. I mean, the, uh, a lot of your research on uh, things surrounding World War II and the Holocaust are very interesting, as well as your uh, um, review about the, the history of the American pharmaceutical industry. Um, this high-level perspective, I'm wondering if you can talk more about the lobbying efforts and general influences that for, these pharmaceutical companies have had over the years to support uh, some of the controversial policies, including the opioid crisis of the 1990s. But more importantly, do you see any of that with this current issue around safe supply? Do we see any influence coming from that area? Thank you. I don't see that influence yet, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Um, you know, I, I'm sort of with my wife, Patricia, who's also an author. We're a two-person operation, so I wish I had a team of researchers that could go out and look at it, we, and we haven't been able to investigate that fully. The, what I do know is this. There is absolutely no doubt that pharmaceutical companies, and when I say that, I'm not just talking about American pharmaceutical companies, because as you know so well, they are multinational companies. If you look at the top 10 biggest, they're all public companies. They operate, uh, they'll, you know, in, in Germany, France, UK, Canada, here in the US, they have regional headquarters. They always claim that they need high prices for their drugs because of the fact that they do so much research and development. And my point on that is that if you take the top 10 companies, the biggest in the world, they spend more on average for promotion, uh, advertising as it is, um, even in medical journals, and on lobbying than they do on research and development. They also spend more on share buybacks. So we know they spend a fortune in terms of making sure that their influence is felt. I don't yet have the evidence. I don't know if it's there to show that there's a hand of, of the pharmaceutical industry behind the safe supply movement. But I do know this, that they certainly are not standing against it. Because when they are against something, as they were against sharing the intellectual property rights, for instance, for COVID-19 vaccines when they were developing them, there was a suggestion we should do the same thing as we did in World War II, and no company would own the rights to penicillin. Everybody would share the research. That they fought. They wanted to keep their patents on individual uh, vaccines. That's fine. Uh, but my point is, you know when they're against something. Uh, 
they stand up and they're very noisy about it. So we haven't seen the Pfizer's, the Lilly's, the Johnson and Johnson's, uh, the Merck's of the world yet standing up in any public forum or campaign and saying, by the way, safe supply is safe, unsafe for the following reasons, X, Y, and Z. I find their silence rather unusual, but I don't yet have the evidence to present to you in this committee, the credible evidence to show you that they have a hand in tipping the scale towards safe supply. Do you have a supplemental no, number? Sir. No. Yes? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Posner? All right, hearing and seeing none, and knowing that we only got 30 seconds left, uh, very much appreciate your time today, Mr. Posner, and uh, your presentation uh, and, uh, and your work. So thank you for joining us today. And uh, we will move on to our next presenter.